It is hard to believe that 20 years has gone by since that has happened. How many of you know there are a lot of crazy things going on right now in our world that we are seeing transpired? We are seeing the book of Revelation lived out before us each and every day. And that's why it's important that we have a pursuit of following the Lord, that we are so in the word that we, whatever we go through, we use it in a way in which we bring glory and honor to the Lord. We are in a series in the book of James. Uh, we're fi finishing up on our fourth week, the, the last two verses of uh, chapter one, and we're going to go into uh, the second chapter here. Uh, but in the book of James, it was written, James was a half-brother of Jesus, and he, in the book, he doesn't uh, kind of use that, but he says, I am but a bondservant to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he uses this text to encourage believers who were going through persecution, who was going through uh, an oppression. Um, and so we see that he's using this to encourage us. And he says in, in the beginning of chapter one, count it all joy when you go through trials. And the reason in which we can count it all joy, because we know that God is at work. The second thing he talks about is temptation. That the enemy, that God uses trials uh, that we might grow, but the enemy uses temptation to destroy us. He goes on um, to say, if you will, that um, in, in the next one of how we are to react in the midst of temptation, that we are to be uh, quick to hear, hear what? Here's what God has to say about things. We are to be slow to speak and slow to anger. I was thinking about this the other day. I was putting up a um, change in a battery on a smoke detector. And I couldn't for the life of me get that stupid cover off of it. And I've done it before where I actually ripped it off the wall because of that stupid beeping that is so irritating that goes off every minute. And so I'm reading it and it says Twitter for off, but for more instructions, go to your manual. Now, how many of you know a real guy never goes to the manual unless you have to, right? Before we had navigations, men don't use maps. We try to figure it out on our own. I can remember one of the, the toys the kids got, and it must have had 3,000 pieces to it, and the instructions, it was like crazy. And so what you do, you try to figure it out. But there's times in which you can't figure it out, so you have to go to the instructions and go in detail, and it makes sense. And I, I think the same thing is that we discover that there are times when I need instructions. After I struggle with something for a while and there's no progress, I'll give the instructions a glance. And then there are times when I get over my head and I have to turn to the instructions for help. And one of the areas in life that we are constantly in need of, and that is walking in the Christian life. Would you agree with that? It's an area where we can't afford to waste time to figure it out on our own or for myself uh, or make my own rules. I need to know what God's instruction is for my life. And that's why I love the book of James because he gives us so much even in the first chapter in our pursuit of God where we must be. And he gives us that instruction that encourages and keeps us in the center of God's will and keeps us in the everlasting way. If you look at the very first verse with me here, it's James 1. It's the last two verses. It's probably going to be a short message here today. But he says this in First James, or in James 1, 26 and 27. <clears throat> and he says this, If anyone thinks himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this person, religion, is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So there is a lot to unpack in that, that uh, two verses right there that we see. If anyone thinks himself religious, does not bridle his tongue. 
It is one of the things in which we walk in the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, and self-control. There's a certain amount of self-control that he's saying that we must have with our tongue. And let me say this, most people think that they are religious. Uh, most people in this world think they're religious. Um, and the reason they think that they're religious is because they have religious activity that coincides with what religious people do. How many of you know religious people go to church? You are here today, so you must be religious, right? Somebody answer that phone, tell them Pastor Brian says good morning. You should be in church so you could be religious. Anyway, how about this? Religious people pray. We prayed this morning. Pastor Johnny led us in a prayer for the body, for the needs of the body. Uh, we worship, we sing. That's what religious people do. Uh, religious people recognize a certain days of the year, don't they? We recognize the day of thanks and we give thanks uh, we celebrate Christmas and our living nativity and the, the manger scene. And, and at least the religious come to church on Easter. And we recognize those special days. And so there's even people that uh, uses a religious exemption to get away from taking a COVID shot. One of the gals from our work said that uh, somebody there at the department didn't realize how many religious people worked there until they got these slips to say they were religious, they weren't taking the shot. And so it is amazing how some people think that they are religious and they are close to God. And they think that they're religious because they have, listen, external observations in religion. Let me say that again, external observation. The only people that Jesus railed against was never sinner. He only railed against the religious. Because they had an external form of religion. And they would go and, and they would have people, the religious, would blow trumpets. Everybody would look at them and they would take money out of their purse and they would give it to the poor people that everyone could see. When they were fasting, they put like, like a flower on their face or they look peaked and people go, wow, look how spiritual they are. John called them a brood of vipers and Jesus said they're like whitewash. They're, they're, they're all religious on the outside, but they're hollow on the inside. And so Jesus railed against the religious. External things that they do. But what James is about is to tell us in contrast the distinction between a worthless religion and true religion. That vertical religion is not enough to call yourself religious. If you, if you look at the cross, you see uh, the vertical, that Jesus was there following in the center of God's will, fulfilling his will. Let not my will be done, but your will be done. And then there is a horizontal that Jesus was not only in tune with the Father, but he has a horizontal relationship where he came to save all of us. And the same is true in our lives. We need that vertical relationship, but it's more than that because it is fulfilled in that horizontal relationship that we have with others and James says it this way that pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father is this to visit the orphans and the widows in their distress see back in the Bible days it, it was even more important because they often had nobody and if they didn't have any family they they were completely destitute and some of them would literally starve to death and so it was an obvious thing back in the Bible days that James is addressing. And he says, if you don't do something about it when you see your religion is worthless. And that is a point in contrast. He goes on to say in James chapter two, we're gonna look at verse, verses 14 through 16, 
<clears throat> he says this, what use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, yet do not give them what is necessary for the body, what use is that? Now, it is interesting what he says. What use is that? What use is a religion if you have the ability to feed somebody or to give them drink or to give them clothes, but you don't do it? Uh, what, how can that faith save you if you say that, but you don't do that? And so it's very important. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, Mo, I, I, I'm in need of food, and, and I, I, I could use this, I could use that. And you go, hey, good luck to you. I'll be praying for you. God bless you. We'll see you. No. Uh, if you have the ability to do something, which I believe we all do, we're called to do it. Now, the next verse is 1 John 3.16. If you can add verses 19 through that. We're going to go 16 through 19. We didn't have room on the outline, but we're going to read the whole thing, and it's going to be on the screen for you. And it says this, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. But whoever has worldly goods and see his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. We will know by this that we are of truth and will set our heart at ease before him. So he says, love ought to include two things. The first one is truth. So if there is a, a lazy man who's lazy and he's irresponsible, um, you don't necessarily give him something, you give him the truth. And, and the truth says this, if you don't work, you don't eat. Because there's some people who have the ability uh, to work, right? But they're just lazy and irresponsible and they want other people to take care of them. We see more and more of that in our world today. So you give them the truth. But it should be accompanied by deed, that we come alongside others and help them without expecting anything in return. And that's what I love about our church. There's a lot of you in here that help other people. You don't get any uh, benefit and you're just a giving person and God will bless you in that. And it is a testimony of your faith. Because see, the religious people have that outward form of being religious. And Jesus says, unless you're more religious then the Pharisees, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And they're like freaking out. How can we be more spiritual than them? Look how spiritual they are. Look at all the outward things in which they do. Hmm. But it has to reach the heart. And then not only the heart, but it needs to show its expression in loving others and in helping others others see in in james that first verse that we read in the sight of god the father to visit orphans and widows the word visit in greek um, means to care for to help supply needs there's an interesting text in matthew 25 and in matthew 25 he talks about a great judgment that will occur and it, it's, it, the principle here is, is really good to grasp. He says here, um, where the, the, the sheep are separated uh, from the goats. Now look with me in Matthew 25. We're going to look at verses 33 through 36. And it says this, And he will put the sheep on his right hand uh, and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right Come, you who are blessed of my Father. How many of you want to be blessed by our Father? Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then this is what Jesus says. For I was hungry, 
and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Jesus is talking about the people who have a relationship with him in his heart. It is of those who ministered to Jesus himself. It goes on to say in the next verse in Matthew 25, 37 through 40, he says this, then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Hmm. It is a powerful thing of the ability that we get to minister to Jesus by taking care of the least of these. Hmm. When you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And Jesus knows when we do something for someone who can never repay. I believe one of the most spiritual things this church has ever done was um, our recovery church that we had on Main Street. <laughs> it, it, it was such a powerful thing because we had a church service on Main Street and it was called Recover Church. And the premise behind that is we're all recovering from something, right? And so, so we had uh, different recovery ministries in town and uh, one of the ones that, that our church would help support had over 100 people in it. And they would talk about a higher power and talk about God and I said, boy, wouldn't that be a great bridge to a church, Recover Church. And we had it at two o'clock in the afternoon when a lot of people in recovery wake up and we had a church service on Main Street and I'm telling you, it was one of the most spiritual services we've ever had. And, and uh, we'd have our, our worship team sing and boy, those people in Recover Church sang better than all of you guys. Because they meant it because those who have been saved from much love much. And we would have testimonies of the way people's lives were changed. You know, some offerings in that church service, we had up to 155 people in that service. Some of our offerings were $30. Our, our rent for that was, was 600, it went up to $1,000. <laughs> so we actually went in the hole to minister to people. And you heard me saying that one year we baptized 66 people. Four that I know that are in heaven right now because of that. And to see how lives have changed as people surrendered to the Lord and begin to work and, and to lead and to minister and to bring others. And it was just a powerful thing because none of those people could ever repay for all those who served. Um, so I believe Jesus is pleased with that church service because I believe it was the most spiritual thing we've ever done. People who, who take their time after coming to a service here and then meeting at two o'clock and serving and, and we would do meals for them. Uh, we passed out food every week at that church and needs and, and toothbrushes and different things that, that people need. And for holidays, we would set tables along the front of the church and we would, we would have a holiday dinner together at Easter. We had one table like a family gathering. And, and I think we probably put uh, eight or 10 tables across. Is that right? And, and we had Thanksgiving dinner that some of you all provided. After Easter, we had an Easter dinner with ham and uh, all rotten potatoes, all rotten potatoes and cream beans. And 
And I tell you, it was the most spiritual thing that we did. And some people said, this is the only family that I have. See, that, that is what pleases the Lord. It's not about religion. It's something that goes much deeper, that reaches the heart, and it is extended from the hands. And that's what James is talking about. If you have religion, and you say you have religion, would some people say they have religion? Yeah, I've been baptized. I take communion every week. I'm good. But it means absolutely nothing if it doesn't reach the heart. There's some religions, well, I don't cut my hair or I cut my hair short or I wear a suit, I do this. That's external stuff. Uh, that's burdensome. And that's what the religious people in Jesus' day was trying to do to the people. And that's why Jesus hated it. He said this, you put burdens on people. Any of you have ever been a part of a church that just puts burdens on you? And, and, it, and it weighs you down and you want nothing to do with it because it doesn't feel right. Because it's not about a love relationship with Jesus. When you find that love relationship with Jesus, you want to freely come to him. And you want to be here and to grow and to learn. Hmm. And then in contrast, look at Matthew 25, 41 through 46. And he says this. Then he'll also say to those on his left, depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me either. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You know, even here at our church, we do food ministry and that's good. We also, I consider the least of these is our, our children's ministry uh, and our youth ministry that so desperately need to have the truth put into them. And even in the context of church, I believe the least of these is over here. On Wednesday nights, I teach the kids because I believe they are the least that need it the most. Would you agree? I believe you guys are good. But how many of you know we need to watch our kids and our, our grandkids because we live in tumultuous times when they are getting used to their surroundings and all the things happening in our society today. Uh, seeing freedoms taken away and, and the list goes on. And that's why we all need the truth of God's word in our lives. There's a story um, that brings this out so powerful. Uh, it is a story of the good Samaritan. I will preface this and then we're going to read the verses. But it is a story where the good Samaritan, um, Jesus tells a story. Jesus is out there and a lawyer comes to Jesus to test him or to trap him. Um, we know that lawyers are good at asking questions and he asked Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So it's just on your screen this morning, if you could look at Luke 10, 29, or 10, uh, 25 through 29. And it says this, and behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. 
But wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And so he was trying to get to Jesus to, to kind of get the details, to try to trap him, if you will, on the fine print. And then Jesus tells him this story. Now look on your outline, the last verse here this morning in Luke 10. We're going to look at verses 30 through 37. And he says this, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So this is like a, a priest. He's in a neighborhood where, where, let's say, the temple is. And then it says, so too, a Levite. That would be kind of like an assistant pastor, like a Johnny, who comes by to the place. And he saw him and he passed by on the other side. But then it says, but a Samaritan. Say Samaritan. Samaritans were hated by the Jews, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, meaning he probably got his hands bloody, <coughs> pouring oil and wine, mending, tending to his needs. Then he put the man on his own donkey, which means he's now walking, he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And then he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. <clears throat> what a powerful story that Jesus takes time to unfold before this man. He's basically saying, even your enemies, you help meet their needs. That's your neighbor. See, when you are a neighbor, how many of you know those people find you? And that's what we're called to be and called to do. The last verse is on the screen here this morning. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 27. And it says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Do we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles? And then these are the religious, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice, say it with me, lawlessness. Practice lawlessness. In other words, you're not following in God's will, you're doing your own will. And then he goes on to say in verse 24, therefore, Anyone who hears these words of mine and act on them, say hears and say acts on them, will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on a rock. He goes on to say, and anyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and it, its collapse was great. He's talking about two different people in the text because there's a lot of religious people who think they're religious when they're following in lawlessness. 
How many of you know lawlessness is running wild in our society? It's one of the things of the last days. It says we live in perilous times and it's really when God's people are becoming lawlessness and doing their own thing. They know it's not right, but they do it anyway. And then he says, it is that person when the troubles come that because they built their house on something that is solid, when the troubles come, they're going to stand. Because how many of you know winds come, storms come, and floods come? All of us go through those. That will test the very fibers of our faith, and yet when we're standing on the rock, we will weather it. But those who build their lives on sand, the difference is one is temporary, one is solid. Temporary things would be like our looks. Uh, It would be like uh, possessions or power or uh, those things in life that we, we deem, like if we build our lives on real estate or on the stock market or on this, on this. It's shifting. It changes from one day to the next, one week from the next. And when we build our lives on anything but Christ, who is the rock, when the hard times in life comes, it'll fall. The religious actually think (laughs) that they're going to go to heaven because not only did they pray for people in people's names? They did miracles in Jesus' name. They cast out demons in, in his name. And he says, depart from me. Those, I never knew you. If you go back to the very first verse on your outline, I underlined something for you. It is the last part of verse one. It says, keep oneself unstained by the world. Now, I can have a nice shirt on, and I put a shirt on, And Beth, if she sees a stain on that, it ruins everything. Because all that will be focused on is that stain, right? Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Some can look really sharp, but they got a stain, and it's hard to focus on how nice they look because you just focus on that stain. What is that? Do they not know they have a stain on them? And he says here, keep oneself unstained, by the world. I mean, even know the world has gone crazy. And it says in the last days, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. <laughs> and they'll do stupid stuff because they're following with the stupidity of what's going on and the craziness all around. And they get crazy. They love God one minute, they do crazy the next. Live a little bit in the world, live a little bit under the Lord. And he's saying what true religion is. We have a vertical relationship with the Lord that should extend horizontal. We should bridle our tongue. And then we should keep oneself unstained by the world. I want to challenge all of us today. (laughs) to have a deep relationship with the Lord. James is very poignant in his description of don't just hear the word, but be ye doers. Someone once saw me and I was coming out the side here and I try to hurry up to greet most of you. Some of you sneak out to not see me, but some of you greet me and and some when I was coming out and they said oh is the sermon done and I said well the preaching's done but the sermon's not done you know the preaching's done but the sermon's not done because we have to live out the sermon and he says again don't just be hearers of the word You could read God's word every single day. You could hear preaching tapes every single day. But if it doesn't equate to the deeds of fulfilling the purpose that God has for you, it means nothing. And it will show in your life. And that's what we are called to do. I'm going to invite the worship team to...
come here today and encourage all of us as we live in the last days. The Bible says in the last days, he says this, you'll be hated because of me. It's amazing how we can see language turned to a group of people even this week in the news where you can maybe go the vaccinated and the unvaccinated and try to point out the unvaccinated. And I'm thinking to myself, that would be a great way to point out Christians in one way. Because who are the ones who are not getting it a lot of times? Religious exemption. Those are the ones that's going to be at fault for all this. You see how fast things can change? How strong is your faith? Can we stand up under persecution? Because that's exactly what James is talking about for us today. To stand up under persecution, to be encouraged. Don't fall underneath trials, be on top of them. Don't give in to temptation and allow the enemy to defeat you, but be victorious. How is your attitude as you're going through the hard times? Are you fast to hear what God says? Are you slow to speak? As Job says, as he covered his mouth. Are you slow to anger? Do you so have a relationship with the Lord vertically that it translates out horizontally? It is the test of our faith. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today that corrects us and reproves us and brings us to a place we need to be. And Lord, as the preaching is done, the sermon is not. Because it's what means in all importance is what happens when we walk out this door. That the true testament of the church is what happens outside these doors. Because it gives us the opportunity to minister to you, O oh Lord Jesus. That, Lord, that we can feed you and we can give you something to drink and we can clothe you and we can visit you and we can... Do all these things unto you because we've ministered and fulfilled our purpose in life by being sensitive to the needs of those in the house and outside the house. Lord, help us to be mindful of our children, the very least, and those who are in need. Lord, let our faith be translated into action. Lord, we love you and thank you for your word. Lord, strengthen us in these days. Oh, Lord, bring healing to our land because we humble ourselves and pray and seek your face. And we turn from our wicked ways away from the stain. And we'll hear from heaven and you'll forgive our sin and heal our land. Lord, for the things taking place in our world even this week, Lord, we ask that you would intervene. Hmm and heal our land, and heal our lives, and help us to fulfill our purpose that you have for us. And in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, God bless you. Stand with me, and let's sing this song together. God bless you.